confirmation. Amen. That's right. Well, here's the question. If the Father's seeking for it, then can he find it here? Let's go one step deeper. If he can't find it here, can he find it in you? If he can find it in you, then, you know, God is always drawn to the worshiper. There's a couple of things that will always draw, draw God's supernatural attention. That's worship and faith, both those. Worship and faith. So thank you, Father. We just received that confirmation. Thank you for the exhortation to tell others about your grace and where your testimony in the earth and the exhortation just to enter into an intimate place of worship. And we just do take that moment and worship you this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Now it's time to seed and give. It's the end of the month, and there's a lot of expense at the end of the month, so I need your help this morning. So, Father, right now, the tithe and offering belong to you. We come as Abraham did to honor Melchizedek and gave tithes of all he had to Melchizedek. Did not pay tithe, but gave tithe in Hebrews chapter 7. And this morning, I thank you, Lord. It's our heart to give. We're givers. You have given so much freely. So now we just give back. We want your house to be beautiful, strong, full, overflowing, blessed. Every need met, seed to sow from the house. And I thank you that every need is met in advance, and we praise you. Now, your people sowing seed today, Father. And you've said that seed's important to you. You said, he that goes forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again rejoicing. You said that. You said our seed sown is multiplied. You said given shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together. You said you love a cheerful giver. So, Lord, we want to just meet that expectation in your heart, and we're motivated by love. You see, family, we, we give by love. We're motivated by love. Motivation is love, but expectation is faith. I expect this seed that I have in my hand. This is the smallest it'll ever be. It multiplies. Do you believe that this morning? Our money multiplies. God is multiplying my money. So I can be a blessing to everybody around me and help and bless. And I want to help people and love people and serve people and do things that I can't do without money. So God is multiplying my money as I sow today. Thank you, Lord. Now bless our fellowship time. We give you all the glory, all the praise. Thank you. Every need is met. You're glorified in every realm and dimension of this church. And we honor you by honoring one another. In Jesus' name, we said together, amen. All right, come bring your tithe and offering. Let's believe God for good things, and God bless you this morning.
go. God bless you this morning. It's a good day. All right, Miss Dreamy, you come up and get ready, Sandra. Let's do the board real quick. Let's do that. All right, Tuesday at 6.30 is prayer in Fellowship Hall. Wednesday is midweek service. Saturday, May 6th, which is this coming Saturday, will be a memorial here at 4 o'clock for Sammy. And will be our final goodbye to Sammy. And we'll be ministering to him and his family will be here. We're not going to be inside. It's going to be about 30 minutes tops, and that's with fellowship. We're, only, we're going to release balloons in his honor and bless him. Then on May 7th, Cafe 10, church starts at 10 o'clock, and uh, open church next week so everybody can share on the first Sunday of the month. And uh, May 7th, also next week, is Ladies Fellowship at 4 p.m., so be mindful of that. It's a busy week. All right? And praying for the Sloan family this week, Thomas and Sheila, <laughs> Mariah and Simeon. And blessing them and honoring them, what a great blessing they are to us. All right, we went over 10,000 this week, praise God. 10,220 views on the website, praise God. And we're thankful for that, God's good. And uh, that's a lot of people tuning in, and they're starting to tune in from a lot of different places. We're very thankful God is allowing us to expand our borders and our influence. And uh, we are influencing more preachers than we were, and I'm thankful for that. If we can touch other preachers and they start preaching in their churches, then this will grow. And uh, this message of the new covenant is going to become so prevalent and powerful in our day in Jesus' name. All right. All right. Now, Ms. Dreema has an announcement before we do the vision. So, Ms. Dreema. A lot of you were not here last week, and so this may come as a surprise, but we are going to do a church directory. So, we are very excited about that. The dates are May the 22nd and 23rd so it's a month from now it's a Tuesday, Monday and a Tuesday from 2 to 9 and I'll have sign up sheets out here uh, the, um, outside when uh, service is over so you can sign up for a time um, if you have family members that you want to come and, and uh, have some pictures made with them you can um, have uh, packages uh, anybody uh, who doesn't go to church here can still come and get a picture made um, they get a free 8 by 10 and then we get 20% off of all the other purchases we make. We get, in addition to that, a little um, pocket size almost directory that you'll get um, with phone numbers and address and that kind of thing. And also you'll have uh, access to a phone app, which I was really excited about because then you can get that information on your phone. You can get um, again, phone numbers, addresses, pictures of people. So it'll be really nice. And we want everybody to participate. It's going to be really, really good. We haven't done one in, well, not in the time that we've been here, and that's been 12 years. So it's been a long time, so it's time to do it again. So please, please, please participate. Again, you get the free one, and then um, also you'll get uh, to be in that directory, which we really want. I've got uh, a little papers here that has information on it a little bit, but I'll be in the back, like I said, I can give you more, I can even give you the prices, normally they don't give you the prices, but I think they've kind of changed that mentality that people want to know before they get there how much things are going to cost so they're not surprised, so I can show you that and answer some other questions, so please come, and I do need some volunteers, Deborah said she would help, Jacqueline said she would help, so if anyone else can help us, we need people to be here on those days and also some people to help me get folks signed up too. I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Amen. And let me encourage you. They have made that so much better than it was, and it's much quicker now. It's only going to take about 30 minutes for you to come in and get your pictures made, and then for us to have a directory and it's a phone app be, be a thousand times better than it used to be. Praise God. So everybody sign up before you leave today. Let's say it together. We're a family church, a Bible training center. We're changing Lancaster, South Carolina, and we're excited about Jesus. The gospel is changing our city. We believe that. And the spirit of murder and violence and all these things we've heard of lately in the news, they cannot continue in our city in Jesus' name. They cannot. 
in Jesus name we are we are absolutely taking authority over that stuff praying God grant us revival in Lancaster South Carolina our vision is Jesus Christ our mission is to preach teach and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in all the fullness of his glory and power and to radiate his love to our community and unto all the world amen now father we thank you for the day that you have made the breath that you've given Every heartbeat is a gift. Every breath is precious. So help us to celebrate life today. We thank you for every person in the room, every child, every young person, every adult. Lord, it's always our desire to impart, to instruct, and to teach the gospel, to, to ground the people and to grow the people in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of what you've done, who you are, what that means to us. So today as we teach and preach, thank you for fresh oil, fresh anointing. Thank you for impartation, instruction, and thank you that you stir us to believe your word. We set ourselves in agreement. What we read, we will believe. What we read, we will believe it. Men and women of faith and the spirit of faith, we're thanking you and praising you and blessing you for your grace and strength. Good seed sown on good ground, producing good fruit. Not 30, not 60, but in we who hear a hundredfold of your glory, we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. And in agreement with that, we said together, Amen. All right, children, young people, you may go. If you're in the auditorium, you can turn with me this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 4, as we continue in our study of the sounding of the trumpets. And we're just about through. Last week, we didn't quite finish the message of the 22nd trumpet. And... We're sounding 24 trumpets of healing. We're still on the rejuvenation of the body. You're blessed and we call you healed today in Christ. You're righteous by faith. You're resting by faith. Your body's rejuvenated by faith. You're reconciled in your relationships by faith. And you're rich in your resources by faith. And if I were you, I'd get in agreement with the new covenant. God says you're richly blessed deeply loved, highly favored, and celebrated on high. You're the apple of his eye, the heartbeat of his passion. You are his affection. He loves you. And we bless you today. We welcome all of you that are watching by internet, and we thank you for tuning in. May God bless you. And all of you who gave last week on the internet, thank you so much for your seed of giving as well. And we bless you today. Let's study Father's Word. We're learning how to live. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So this 22nd trumpet, and I'm not going to take the time to sound these trumpets again. We're just going to spend our time here today, and we're going to grow, and we're going to learn here today about how to believe God for long life. David died in a good old age. So God says David died in a good old age. Old age is a good thing. Old age is a good thing. Now, we've heard a lot of complaints about old age. We've heard a lot of things said like, you know, getting old sure ain't for wimps. Huh. And now that I'm in my, my early 50s, I know that there's a difference in your body than when you were in your early 20s. And after I went through a major health crisis, I know you have to believe some things and exercise faith to get your body to function properly. And so I live with my mother, who's going to be 84 in September. And uh, thank God for my mother being strong and she got her reports this week, and they told her her labs and her report, and uh, her blood was great, and uh, no diabetes and none of the problems that a lot of people her age have. She's healed. But she'll tell you that it's a little bit different being 84 than it is being 50. But we believe God whether we're 24, 54, or 84, we need to believe God. So this is the exhortation to life, 1 Timothy 4, 7. Number 22, the 22nd trumpet sounds the trumpet of life. You have the promise of the life of God. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is. So we have promise of the life that now is. Now, most people and most preachers would believe that we don't have any control over whether we live or die. That we have no say-so in the matter. And I always had the impression growing up that God had this heavenly dartboard, and he threw darts. And when your number came up, if your number's 54, and when the dart hit 54, you're gone. 
no matter who you are, where you are, what you're doing, can't cheat death, can't get out of debt. Always heard things like that. And so we created a lot of confusion in the body of Christ by teaching people that uh, they had nothing to do with whether they live or die. We have promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Now I want you to turn to Psalms 90 with me. Let me read this one and then I'll get in the word with you. Psalms 90 because this put us all in the mindset that if you make it to 80, you're doing great. And my precious Baptist grandfather, we called him Pappy John, precious man, good man of God, Baptist through and through, loved God, but he would always tell me, Johnny boy, I'm on borrowed time. He was 86, 87, 88, 89, lived, died just before he turned 90. I'm on borrowed time. And in his mind, 80 was about the limit. Now, notice what we're going to read here. This is a psalm of Moses. Moses actually wrote this psalm. And so we'll go to verse 7. Psalms 90 and verse 7. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. We all understand that. Uh, God's anger is a fearful thing, and his wrath is consuming and troubling. Uh, thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. All our days are passed away in thy wrath. Please notice, all our days are passed away in your wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore and ten, and by reason of strength fourscore years. Yet in their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Hence the song, I'll fly away, O glory, speaking when I die. Who knows the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Now notice here that God said through Moses, the days of man shall be 80 years. Now let's see if we can believe God to overcome tradition and walk in the truth. Are you ready? When we study the New Covenant, we find out, number one, there's a controversy between two men. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, wrote and said that my inward man is renewed day by day, but my outward man perishes. The word perish in the Greek language means it decays, it changes, and not for the better. Thus, when preachers have read that, then they just simply embraced it without studying further to find out if there's an answer for the dilemma. Now, our dilemma is not an old man and a new man. Our old man was crucified on the cross. My old life is dead. Old things passed away. My old life is gone. But my dilemma, and I am in this present circumstance today, I am living in a body that is aging. And in case you're wondering, you're a day older than you were yesterday. And from last Sunday, you're a week older. And from last year, you're a year older. And from 10 years ago, you're 10 years older. Now, the only way to get you out of aging is to go ahead and let you go home to be with Jesus. <laughs> and now, everybody wants to go to heaven, just nobody wants to go today. Christians talk about how homesick they are for heaven. I want to go to heaven. Not so much as you think you do. If you really want to go to heaven, come up here and I'll pray for you. You drop dead. <sighs> Never have any takers on that one. I've offered that all across the country. Nobody ever wants to come up. Pray for me that I just drop dead right now. Now, I have prayed for people at the, at, at the, at the bedside of elderly people that wanted to go and release them, but that's different. You don't have people sitting in church who come up and say, I just want to go home today. We all want to go there someday, but not today. Praise God. So we give God praise and honor. So we've got to find out what God did about the controversy. And in Deuteronomy 25, stripes in the controversy between two men. Very clear. The first mention of stripes in your Bible is that the stripes in the controversy between two men. So in the New Covenant, God had Jesus striped. And by those stripes, that ends the controversy. Now what's happening in my inward man, I'm renewed day by day. So you live in a revival. You are a revival. 
Now, I want you to believe that, that you're revived every day. You're not dry. You're not dead. You're not desensitized. You are quickened in the realm of spirit. Your spirit's alive. God is living in your spirit. God is breathing in you. So thank God I am revived today. I am alive and I am being revived today. God is reviving me. My spirit, man, never grows old, never grows weak, never grows tired, never gets weary. My spirit is always alive. God lives in my spirit. He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. My inward man is renewed, but my outward man perishes. So what God did through Jesus when he put sickness in Christ, put it on the cross and put it to death, he then gave himself the legal right to get in you and quicken your body by his spirit according to those stripes. And the healing life of Jesus works in your body as you believe by his stripes you were healed. And then the spirit of God takes by whose stripes you were healed in your faith and begins to work that into your body. And if your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. Now, there's your healing. Duality is deadly. The Bible teaches we're to have a single heart, we're to have a single thought, we're to have a single word in our mouth, and we're to have a single vision. Duality is deadly. If thine eye be single, then your body shall be filled with light. There's healing life strength. I look unto Jesus, I expect my body to be filled with light. That light is the quickening life of Jesus that raised him from the dead in you by the Spirit. So God wants you quickened. The controversy is over. And 1 Timothy chapter 3.16 said, The mystery is great without controversy. And when you remove the controversy, the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, becomes far greater because the controversy is out of the way. So today, even though my body's aging, I have a right to believe that he is renewing my youth like the eagles. I have a right to believe that he's renewing my youth like the eagles today, now. And the Spirit of God works according to that faith to quicken my mortal body. So we should live in a quickened state or at least a quickened mentality all the time. Never talking about how weak we are, how tired we are, how lack of energy we have. We must talk about the quickening life of God. I'm full of the life of God today. I'm quickened by the Spirit. I'm energized. And in my body I'm strong today now in Jesus' name. And that's the state and the posture of mind and mentality God wants you to take on for every day before you get out of bed to put a crown on your head and let that be your thought today. I'm quickened by the Spirit according to the stripes of Jesus. I'm not living in a controversy. I'm living in the quickening power that raised Jesus from the dead. The controversy is over. The stripes ended the controversy between two men. Deuteronomy 25, 1 through 4. That's what the stripes of Jesus were for laid on his back. And then because preachers have not understood that reality and that truth, preachers got into confusion. And so tradition has really robbed us here. Let me give you again very quickly. Job 14, 1 is a very famous funeral scripture. Man born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. Now notice if I believe that and I set myself in agreement with that, and please note that Job 14, 1 is true. Why is it true? Because it's the Word of God. And if you're just born of a woman and you're not born again, then you are full of trouble. You are trouble. Trouble is going to follow you. Dead in trespasses and sin. And your days will be few. In the light of eternity, the days you live, you may live to be 90 years old. Sinners sometimes live to be 100. That's a few days in the light of eternity. But you are not just born of a woman. You are born again. You are born of God. And today, you are not full of trouble. You're full of the Holy Ghost. You're full of the life of God. You're full of Jesus Christ Himself. And today, your days are lengthened and you are strengthened because God is your Father. And Jesus came to bring you life. So just about every funeral you go to around here, when they bring the family in, the first thing you hear on the loudspeaker is, man born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. And I've heard that at least 75 times. And 
you cannot preach that over the life of a believer. You cannot preach that over me and you. I'm not born of woman. Whosoever is born of God, you must be born again. I'm born again, not of corruptible, but incorruptible, indestructible seed by this word which lives and abides forever. And in that new birth, there's no defect. In that new birth, there is nothing. There's no deficit in your new birth. You're born again, blood washed, redeemed. You're born of God. You are a new creature in Christ. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's what you are. A brand new identity. Amen. See, you were born in sin. You've been born again in righteousness. People argue, I was born this way. You may have been, but you ain't born again that way. That's a lie. And anybody believing a lie is going to propagate a lie. And they believe a lie, love not the truth. There's damnation. There's judgment in that. Don't believe a lie. I was born again. I may have been born sick, but I'm born again healed. I may have been born in sin, but I'm born again in righteousness. Don't believe a lie. Your new birth is greater than your first birth. And then preachers will add to Job 14, 1 James 4, 14, which one translation I read this morning said, your life is a puff of smoke. <laughs> Ain't that encouraging? James 4, 14 said, your life is but a vapor that appears but for a moment. Now here's the thing about James 4, 14. Your life is but a vapor. That's your life. Jesus said, if you save your life, you'll lose your life. He also said, if you lose your life, you'll save your life. And either on either side of that, you lose. You can't win doing that. If you lose your life, you'll save it. You still saved it. When you save it, you still can't save it. You see, if that would have been for you, he would have said, you lose your life and I'll save it. He said, you lose your life, you'll save it. You save your life, you still got to be your own Savior. If I was you, I'd repent of that kind of thinking. No, praise God, I died in Christ on the cross. I, praise God, I'm quick and raised seated with Him. And He lives in me. He's my salvation and Savior. My life is but a vapor, but His life is eternal. And now it's Christ who lives in me. And my life and His life have been intermingled. We started this morning. He's alive. Jesus said, because I live, you'll live also. So you got to give up this idea that your life is just you living and it's just you. It's Christ in you. It's His life. He's raised from the dead. He's victorious. He's glorious. His life has become your life. And Romans 5 verse 10 said, we are saved by His life. And then Psalms 90. Preachers will say, now you know good and well, the Bible plainly says that your day, even if you're a strong man, 80 years and anything over 80 years is borrowed time. That's Baptist theology. God bless the Baptist. However, you notice in Psalms 90 that our days are consumed in your wrath and in your anger. You'll notice in Psalms 90, Moses said, you've set our sins, even our secret sins, the things nobody else knows about, before your face. Well, let's shout this morning. That's Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, he took my secret sins to the cross. In the New Covenant, he put all my sins on the cross... And he put them all to death. Behold the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. David said in Psalms 51, My sin is ever before me. Now I can say my sin is ever behind me because it died on the tree. So I can say because Jesus died my death and took my sin and bore what I was, then God saw the travail of his soul. God satisfied. And I can tell you assuredly today, God is not mad anymore. So my days are not consumed in his anger. My days can be lengthened in his pleasure. He's not mad with us anymore because Jesus paid our debt. Jesus took our sin, took our curse, took what we were, put it to death, and our sins are not before him evermore. Now the new covenant is before him, and our sins have been dealt with and removed and forgiven and cleansed, and they are gone. You are forgiven, cleansed, free, and delivered because of Jesus' mighty, holy death on that cross. So when you get to 80, you ought to be warmed up. You ought to be warmed up. You ought to be getting the hang of it by the time you get to 80, praise God. You get warmed up, praise God. I got 80 years under my belt. David died in a good old age. 80 is a good thing if you know how to believe God. So even when God was mad, hacked off, even when God said, it grieved me that I made man, he said, the days of man shall be... 120 years, Genesis chapter 6. And God never said anything else about that. 
And Genesis chapter 6 and the first 6, 7 verses is just as much the Word of God as any other part of it. He said the days of man should be 120 years. But what's been wrong with us is we believed if we made it to 80, anything past 80 was real good. 80 is technically two-thirds of the journey. Now, I'm speaking over you that you're going to live and not die and declare God's work in your generation. I'm speaking over you that you got 120 years in you. You're quicken. And when you get to 80, you'll have enough wisdom, sense, and greater anointing to start doing some things you couldn't do before you got to 80. That you're going to be stronger in your 80s than you were in your 40s because of God's working in you. You're not going to do that on your own. You'll die in your own strength. You'll die trying to save your life. If you just depend on good nutrition and good water and exercise, that'll leave you dead. That's not bigger than Adam's transgression. You know, you can eat all the good food you want to. It's not bigger than what Adam did. You can drink all the bottled water you want, but it's not bigger than what Adam did. But what Jesus did is bigger than what Adam did. And you start counting on that. Now, it's good to take a little wisdom with your food and your diet and your water, but believe what Jesus did is bigger. Jesus can make you live. Put life in your physical body so we are delivered from all the traditions of the things that we have heard in the church. Ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, to dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis chapter 3, God said that to Adam, but he didn't say that over Jesus, and he didn't say that over you. You are not dust, you're spirit. And you're not going back to the dust, which is the serpent's meat. You're going into the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And I can stand over the body of any believer that has departed and say, this mortality shall put on immortality. And this corruption shall put on incorruption. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. Jesus got up from the dead in a glorified body and said, Handle me, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. He's more than just spirit. Stephen said, I see the Son of Man at the right hand of the Father in Acts chapter 7. In order for him to be the Son of Man, he had to be in that glorified body. Philippians 3 said, He'll give you a body. Not just a spirit, not just a soul. He'll give you a body like His glorified body. He'll do it. He's faithful. Your job is to not figure out how or when. Your job is to believe He will. People argue and fuss. Is there a resurrection, a graveyard resurrection? Do we have a new body? Is it coming from heaven? Stop all that. Your business is not to figure that out. Your business is to believe He'll change your vile body. And you don't need to wait till you die to believe that. You need to believe He'll change your body now. Quicken it and make it live. By His stripes you're healed. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And I will take sickness from the midst of thee. He'll bless your body with health. I restore health unto thee and heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 30, verse 17. And then you see in creation that God's purpose for man was to live. He said, in the day you do this, you'll die. In the day you do this, you will die die hear it again in the day you do this not in the day I do this not in the day that your adversary does this in the day you do this you will die Romans 5 makes it very clear 12 through 21 that death passed upon every man by Adam's transgression and because of what Adam did a curse was released in the earth and the curse is spiritual it's mental it's physical it's social and it's financial it's fivefold. Jordan, the river Jordan in the Old Covenant means death, descent, decline. It means destruction. When you see Jordan, it flows out of the city of... It flows out of the city of Adam in Joshua chapter 3. When the ark went in the waters, the city of Jordan or the river of Jordan rolled all the way back to the city of Adam. When Jesus went in the waters of death, he did something about what flows out of Adam. Christ redeems you from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through our Lord Jesus Christ. You're blessed today. So God's purpose was to make man to live. When Adam sinned, death came. Because of that, then the curse came in the earth. And the curse, again, is spiritual, mental, physical, social, and financial. If you study the curse of the law, you find every sickness and every disease is under the curse of the law. Well, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. You'll find out Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We're redeemed from it. We are redeemed. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. 
So the pain and misery of the curse is in manifestation everywhere. You don't have to look far to see the curse, to experience the curse. We've all experienced the curse, but we're redeemed from it. God wants you free from the curse. You are not the curse. You are the blessed seed of Abraham. If you be Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are the blessed seed of Abraham in Jesus' name. Now, Jesus came, and because Jesus came, when he died on the cross, he dealt with the subject of death. Now, I want you to take your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. Let's turn there. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. This one's not used very much in church, but it is a good one. You know, they're all good if you understand them in the light of the gospel. They're all good. Man, I can preach good news out of the book of Job. Praise God. Preachers used to scare me when they would open up the book of Job. Now let's listen to this. Here he says this morning, Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Now notice, when Jesus rose from the dead, he said, A spirit hath not flesh and bone. When Jesus was raised from the dead, there's no blood there. You know how I know that? Because the blood's on the mercy seat. He's got a glorified body, and in his, in his body flows the glory of God. And when you get a glorified body, you're going to have one like his. And I believe that's a powerful revelation that there won't be any more blood. No need for blood. Jesus said, A spirit hath not flesh and bone. Here, he partook of flesh and blood. That's my flesh and blood. Flesh and blood ties you to the subject of humanity. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. We've all partaken of flesh and blood. We've all partaken of humanity. We know what it is to sin. We know what it is to be afraid. We know what it is to be sick. We know what it is to be broken, to be hurt, to be broke. We know what it is to be fearful. We know what it is to be rejected. We've all partaken of flesh and blood. So look what he says here. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So Jesus entered into your humanity through that cup, and he took your flesh and blood. He took that. Now, you've all heard this scripture in church. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What that means is in your humanity, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. So you come to the communion table, and you lay down your flesh and blood by faith, and you take up his flesh, which is this is my body broken for you, and you take up his blood, and then you get flesh and blood that can inherit the kingdom of God because the kingdom is his. You can't get this through your first birth. You have to get it through what he did. He also partook of the same that through death. So how's he going to do it? To do it through death. Through is a preposition. Through death means he entered it and he went all the way through it. He experienced every part of death there is. Our separation from God, our sin, our curse. Everything Adam did through death. If I sit through a movie, that means it starts at 7, ends at 9. I sit through the movie, that means I stay all the way through. If I walk through the building, I go out the front door, I come in the back door, I go through the building. He went through death. Praise God, he did it all. He went through death. He bore every aspect of death. There's nothing in death he didn't bear. He bore it all. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Destroy here. Render powerless or unemployed or make useless the powers of the devil. He did that. How did he do it? By going through death, he took its power. Now watch this. And deliver them. So see, the purpose of that was to deliver them. He wants you delivered today. <clears throat> deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So that means as long as we're afraid of dying, we're always going to be subjected to bondage. Now I want you to get this seed in your heart. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. So if you were to die today, that's gain. So there's no need for you to fear gain. It would be lost to us if you passed away, but gain to you. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So there's no reason to be afraid of death anymore. Jesus said the serpent and the scorpion are under your feet, and the scorpion represents death. He has given you authority over this death because he has authority over death. Death has no power over him, therefore it has no power over you. 
Now, the church does not believe that. Can I go a little further? Preachers don't believe that. And I'm just starting to believe that because that's a stretch from the things I've been taught and the things that I've even experienced in my life. But Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. So the power of even death, in the book of the Revelation, the scorpion is death, is under your feet. So then we can say like David, Praise you, Father, I'll live and not die, and declare God's work in my generation. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And we which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord. Your expectation should be life, not death. In Isaiah chapter 25, God said, I'm coming to a mountain. I am going to spread my arms, and I am going to prepare a feast for all people. It's a feast of wine and of the fat things and of the blessing of the Lord. And he said, there I am going to swallow death on a mountain. Isaiah 25 starts at verse 6. He came on a mountain, Jesus on the cross. Everybody look this way. He spread his arms. He fulfilled Isaiah 25. And he tasted death for every man. Jesus swallowed our death so you and I could take his life in us. He swallowed our death. And Jesus died at 33 years old. A young man. So you could expect and have expectation to live your days in strength. And God said, even in the Old Covenant, as your days, your strength shall be, saith the Lord. God's Word. Praise God. So now I have a covenant of life called the promise of the life that now is. That promise is spiritual, is mental, is physical, is social, and it's financial. There's not a moment of the day, there's not a moment in the day of any day that God has not said, by whose stripes you're healed. God said you're healed once, finally, forever. Psalms 89, 34, I'll not alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. God said you're healed. God said you're healed. Does that mean anything to you? God said, sun be, and the sun was. Look at the sun. It's a revelation of what he said. God said, moon and stars be, and there they were. They're a revelation of what he said. He said, it's written. Now, we're beyond controversy. It's written, 1 Peter 2, 24, by whose stripes you were healed. Isaiah 53, 5, with his stripes we are healed. It is written. So, therefore, we have the promise of covenant. Now, we have a covenant of life with him. He is our life. Now, what you do with the promise, the promise is of grace that it might be of faith. He gave the promise to every man, woman, boy, and girl. Now, what you do with the promise is up to you, and God wants you to believe it. So the last thing you ought to be thinking about is dying. You ought to be thinking about living. I was walking out of the gym the other day, and a woman said, Do you have a will? I said, Yes. She said, what kind of will? I said, well, the last will and testament of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The only will I care about. She looked at me like I just reached out and hit her with a wet dish rag. She said, what? I said, well, this is the last. I didn't have my Bible with me, but I said, with the last will and testament of my Lord, Jesus Christ. And He will me life. He will me life. You don't get your inheritance when you die. You get it when the one that willed it to you died. And I started talking to her, and she said, well, don't you have a will? I said, I have my affairs naturally in order, but I ain't got dying on my mind. I'm planning on living. She said, well, you don't know if you're going to live past the day. I said, yes, I do. She looked at me and said, well, she said, how do you think you know that? I said, because God said, I have promise of the life that now is, and I believe that promise. You start getting confidence in living. And then she started in on this horror series. Well, what if you go out here and get in your car and get killed on the highway? <laughs> Lady, you, you're, you're egging on the wrong preacher here. You don't want to get into this conversation with me. No evil shall befall me, neither any plague come nigh my dwelling. A thousand fall at my side, ten thousand in my right hand. It shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold the reward of the wicked, because you've made God the most high thine habitation. No evil shall befall you, praise God. And with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I said, ma'am, I'm going to tell you, I've been sentenced to life. i got a life sentence on me. I'm going to live. And I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach it till I'm an old, old, old man. I'm going to live and preach and expect to be well and strong. Thank God for what Jesus did. And she's looking at me like, my goodness, why did I stop this fellow in the first place? You could tell she was ready for the next customer. 
because she wasn't going to sell me a make up your will kit. I don't need one. Now, I do have my affairs in order. Don't get me wrong. I take care of natural things, but that's not my fault. My fault's living, not dying. One time I had an insurance man come by the house. Anthony and Krista were little, and I was trying to get them ready for bed, and Teresa was out. And the insurance man, he was trying to talk to me while I was trying to take care of two little kids. Now, I'm the typical father. You know, fathers are just not as good at taking care of kids as mothers. Unless you're another. Now, there may be some who are, but this one wasn't. I mean, you know, you turn around, and Anthony might have his underwear on his head. You know, that kind of thing. No, that's, you know, it's just one of those things. It's just, it's just hard to do. I, I'm just not good at this kind of thing. And Chris, so here we are. And this insurance man is tra- trying to talk to me. He said, Mr. Cahill, what if you died? And I turned around and I said, you know what? Dying would be the cheapest thing ever happened to me. It don't cost nothing to die. I'm not, I need somebody to help me live. I need somebody to help me get this boy's britches on right and get him to bed. I'm not worried about that. I ain't got time to die no how. What if you die? What if I live? That's my question. The church has been asking, what if you die? What are you going to do if you live? What if you live? What if you live? Are you ready to live? Are you ready to see God? Are you ready to experience God? Are you ready for God to breathe in you and change you and revolutionize you and make you a living, breathing revelation of His power, His glory, and a testimony of Jesus in the earth? Are you ready to live? Man, getting ready to die, that's easy. I got born again in 1979. But Jesus partook of death, that through death he might deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And under the curse, he said, you'll fear the morning. And you'll say, would God it were evening. I just wish this day were behind me. And under the curse, you'll say, would God it were morning. Oh, that I'd not die in the night. Fear, all this fear. But God delivers you from the spirit of fear. You have life. He sentenced you to life. You have a promise of the life that now is. Now do yourself a favor and believe the promise. Thank you, Father. You promised me life. I receive your life. I thank you. I'll live and not die and declare your work in the generations of the earth. I thank you, Lord. And then pray this, Lord, make me so valuable that the earth needs me and people need me and need who I am, what I am, and make me valuable. I'm an earthen vessel, but put your treasure in me until people here in the earth have to hear what there flows out of me. God, let me be that valuable to you. And he'll do it. He wants that for all of his kids. Praise God. Now we're down to personal choices. Now we're down to choices. Let's look. At 2 Samuel. Do you remember this man, Barzilla? Let's read his story. 2 Samuel 19, verse 32. I asked one preacher who Barzilla was, and he, he smiled and said, I don't have a clue. Maybe he's Godzilla's brother. That's not. <laughs> no, this is not Godzilla and Barzilla. No, Barzilla was a man in your Bible. That's pitiful, isn't it? Well, he's Godzilla's brother. I said, no, no, wrong movie, wrong movie. (laughs) 2 Samuel 19.32. Barzilla was a very aged man. That means he was old, four score years old. How old was he? Eighty. What did God say about him? He was old. I want you to get that in your thinking. He's old at 80. I've met some people old at 40. When I first moved to town, I ran into a 97-year-old woman down here in town taking food to people. And I just happened to be driving my uh, old van. Well, it was that time I had the Taurus. I was driving the Taurus, and I went around and uh, the corner, and there she was, and I just felt impressed to stop. So I, I got out. And I asked her, because she looked like she was having problems, and she looked up in the sky, and so I got out to help her. And I said, ma'am, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm trying to take this food, this box, but it's too heavy for me to get out of the trunk. I want to take it to some old people that live here. And, you know, she looked to be about 70, 72 maybe. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I really appreciate your heart because it was a very hot, sunny day. Thank you. And she looked at me, and she says, how old do you think I am, boy? And I said, well, I figure you're about 70. She said, I'm 97. And I said to myself, I'm about to get a revelation. If you're 97 and you're taking food to old people, I wonder who's behind that door. I want to go back there and see who's behind the door. They got to be 120. (laughs) She said, I'm 97. She's still driving a car. She just couldn't lift that heavy box. 
And she said to me, she said, no, they're a lot younger than I am. They're only in their late 70s. But she said, they think old. They are old because they think old. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. What's your secret? She said, well, first of all, and she said, my daddy was a preacher. And my daddy taught me to thank God for good health every morning before I get out of bed. She said, every day of my life, I thank the Lord for good health and strength. And she said, son, I'm 97, and I've barely been sick my whole life. Just a sniffle here and there, never been sick. She said to me, never been in the hospital, 97 years old. She said to me, I had three children, but never been in a hospital. She said, can you help me with a box? I said, sure. So I picked the box up, carried it in, came out. And she said, son, always thank God for your health. And then she leaned into me and smiled and said, Son, keep moving. They can't throw no dirt on you while you're moving. <laughs> Got in her car and drove off. I read the obituary a couple years later. I think she lived to be 101. What a life. Carrying food to old people at 97. Good Christian lady. Barzilla was an old man, 80 years old. He provided for the king of substance while he lay at Manahem, for he was a great man. So God says he's an old man, but he's a great man. And the king said to Barzillai, come over with me and I'll feed you, which means I'll sustain you, bless you, everything you need, I'll provide it for you. That's God's offer to us. He said, if you'll come with me and take this journey, everything you need, I'll provide everything you need. I'll be your strength, I'll be your joy, I'll be your wisdom, I'll be your length of days. Everything you need, I'll provide it for you. And Barzillai said unto the king, how long have I lived? See, he's got dying on his mind. How long do I have to live that I should go into the king with Jerusalem? I'm this day 80 years old, and can I discern between good and evil, saying, not quite as sharp as I used to be? Can your servant taste or eat what I used to? Listen, I don't taste as good as I used to. I don't see as well, don't eat as well. Then Barcella said, can I hear any more the voice of singing men or singing women? Wherefore should your servant be a burden to my lord the king? He's got in his mind, look, I'm 80 years old. My mind ain't as sharp as it was. I don't taste and see like I did. I can't hear the young maids sing. I can't see the young men dance anymore. I'd just be a burden to you, king. Listen to me. Jesus will never look at you as a burden. You're not a burden. He wants to bless you and make you a blessing to people. Jesus can sustain you. Jesus can keep you. You are not a burden. In this man's mind, I'm just in your way. A lot of older folk get to that point. I'm just in the way. Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king. Maybe I'll go past a little past 80. And why should the king recompense me with such a great reward? Why would you want to bless me on that fashion? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. You know, you've never given a cup of water in his hand that he doesn't remember it. You know, you've never given a dime or dollar that he doesn't remember it. You know, you've never prayed for anybody. He doesn't remember it. He is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. Everything you've ever done in his name with a heart of love, he remembers it. And he loves you. And he loved you before you did it. He loved you when you were cursing his name. What does he say? Let your servant, I pray thee, turn back that I may die in my own city. Let me go back and die. See, he's got dying on his mind. Again, the last thing you ought to have on your mind is dying. Live in Jesus' name. Live in Jesus' name. Live in Jesus' name. And be buried by the grave of my father and my mother. Behold, thy servant shall not. Let him go over my, with my lord the king and do to him what seems good unto thee. And the king answered and said, He shall go over with me, and I will do to him that which seems good to you, and whatsoever you require me, I will do for you. I'm going to bless these that you ask of, because, see, God's still answering his prayer. You see that? Whatever you ask of me, I'm going to do for you. And all the people went over Jordan, and when the king was come over, the king kissed Barzilla, blessed him, and he returned to his own place. So here's the picture of what happens. See, God wants to prepare you now because we relatively are a younger congregation. God wants to prepare us now to grow into old age and be ready to be used. Thomas, I expect you to be singing 20 years from now better than you did today. And you sang wonderful today, but I expect you to be singing stronger, louder than you did today, 20 years from now, in Jesus' name. Because when you get 20 years from now, how much more anointing, word, understanding will he have put in you? 
And what's happened is when God gets people to this place in their old age, people have got dying on their mind and feel like they become a burden, and God wants to bless. And God has some gifts and callings and anointings and things that He wants to do with people in their 80s and 90s and on beyond that that they can't walk in really before that because it's a, it's a matter of inexperience, it's a matter of immaturity. And for some of us, if God used us in the way He really wanted to, it'd go straight to our head. And the last thing God's ever going to do is give you a big head. He'll give you a big heart. He'll give you a big heart. Well, most of the time, by the time you get to be 80 years old, you know, you understand it. It wasn't you anyway. If you live to be 80, you know most people that are 80 years old know God kept them and hadn't been for the Lord on their side. Their enemies would have triumphed them and they'd be dead. They know that. They understand it. So he gets to be 80 years old and he says, let me go back. And so David let him go back. And now notice, Barzilla had the choice. David could have said, no, you coming with me and made him go. But David let him make the choice. And so he turned back and he went back to die and be buried by his father and buried by his mother. Don't turn back. Don't turn back. See, you got a choice in the matter. I said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus Christ, he chose your death. He chose your curse. He took you so you could choose his life. You have a choice in the matter. You have a choice. Barzilla had a choice. But I love this about David. David wasn't angry. David didn't say, look, I need you. You've got to go with me. David loved him. David blessed him. David kissed him. And David let him go back. And God will let you make your choice. And a lot of people have made the choice here. And thus, they went home to be with the Lord right at a time when God could have mightily used them in a greater dimension had they pressed in and on. And there is a pressing because everybody comes to this place sooner or later. I do know laying in the deathbed three years and three months ago, I had a choice on that morning. I do know I could have went home that day. I do know I had a choice. Wasn't all my choice. God stepped in and intervened. I heard that voice that said, look and you shall live. But I had the choice to look or not. That was my choice. You have a choice in this. If you want long life, ask God for it. If you want long life, ask God for it. And believe God for it. But get dying off your mind. As you get older, what did he say in Psalms 92? The righteous are like the palm tree. They're going to flourish in old age. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They'll bear fruit in old age. You are getting more fruitful. You are getting more productive. Your influence is growing. God is mightily using you. As you grow, you go. And you go and you grow together in Jesus' name. But it comes down to what you believe. Carnal mind will fight you every step of the way. It comes down to what you believe. Now, let me touch this. Jesus was with Peter after he restored him in John 21. And Peter still had some issues. And he was jealous over John, John the Apostle. And so Peter looked and he saw John following Jesus. And Peter said, Jesus, what about him? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus said, Peter, what is that to you? That's none of your business. The best thing you can do is follow Jesus for yourself. Appreciate people that are ahead of you in God. I always thank God for everybody that's ahead of me. I've had some marvelous leaders along the way that have helped me. Thank God for all that are ahead. Thank God for them. But I'm going to follow Jesus whether you do or not. I have to. Follow Jesus for yourself. Peter said, how come? What about him? Jesus said, none of your business. But Peter, you're young. You're young and you're impetuous. And he said, you gird yourself and you go wherever you want to go. And that's what happens to people in their spiritual adolescence. They get, they, lack of a better term, they get a little bit arrogant, a little bit prideful, and they dress themselves. They get up, I'll put on the whole armor of God. I'll put on the helmet of salvation. I'll do these things. And they dress themselves, and they go about where they want to go. And Jesus told Peter that you go about where you go. But he said to Peter, when thou art old, you'll stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird thee, and you'll go where you would not go. So we've come to a place spiritually where I was young, man, I went to preach wherever I could go. I did what I wanted to do, but I'm at a point now where I'm no longer interested in clothing myself. 
I'm stretching forth my hands and saying, you clothe that lily with a greater glory than Solomon. You clothe me today. You put your presence on me. You put your anointing on me. You put your life on me. I'm not clothing myself anymore. That's not my responsibility. I want you to clothe me. You said you would clothe me. You would put on me the robe of righteousness, the garment of salvation. You put on me garments of praise. Stretch your hands and surrender to him. You clothe me. And now you lead me where you will. You want me to preach there, I'll go. If you don't, I won't. If you shut that door, praise God. If you open that door, praise God. None of my business. I'm your responsibility. Lead me where you will. There's no way I would have prayed a prayer like that 20 years ago, but I do now. Anywhere I could go looking for that open door, that opportunity 20 years ago, not now. Another shall gird you. Gird me, clothe me, clothe me, clothe me, Father, as you do the lily. And so several years later, Peter has been taken by Herod and now he's in prison. Two chains, chained, chained around his hands, chained between two soldiers. And Herod had already killed James. And in the morning at sunrise, when the rooster crows, you know, Peter's had some experience with roosters. He knows when the rooster crows that Herod said, I'm going to kill you because it please the people that he killed James. And so Peter is in this jail cell, chained up, and he's between two soldiers, and Herod said at morning, at sunrise in Acts 12, I am going to kill you. And Herod has the authority to do that. So that's a pretty weighty situation. But Peter, in Acts chapter 12, goes fast to sleep. Now, there's some confidence. I can tell you exactly why he went to sleep. There's two reasons. One, he learned from the best. He watched the best sleep in a hurricane. While he was up there trying to fix the problem and bail the water out of the boat, the answer slept in the hinder part of the ship. He learned from the best. And you know you're at your best when you enter into God's rest. And so Peter slept. But the second reason, I'm sure, before he went to sleep, he sat down and thought about what Jesus said. And Jesus said, Peter, when you are old. And Peter laughed and said, I'm not an old man yet. Peter's still a young man at this time. I'm not old. Jesus said, I live to be old. So it's not my business to figure out how he's going to get me out of this. None of my business. But it is my business to believe that he's getting me out of it. So Peter went to sleep because of his confidence in what Jesus had said. And when Peter went to sleep, an angel came, a messenger came, smote him in the side. He stood up. It's time for you to wake up. It's time for you to stand up. And the two chains fall off. You know, when you stand up in Christ, your chains fall off. Do you know when you stand up, your chains fall off? Do you realize you're a new creature in Christ? You're redeemed and blood washed. Nothing can hold you. There is no power of darkness. There is no principality or power. He has defeated them all. Nothing can hold you. You're free. Free at last. In Jesus' name, you are free. And the angels started walking with him. And there were three gates, one open. The second opened, and he came to this iron gate. It's an iron gate, and it says to say it's closed. And when you get to that iron gate, a lot of people have walked through the new birth, and they walked through Pentecost, but this iron gate of the most holy place. And when he got to it, it says you can come here, but you can't go there. You can come here, but you can't walk in that. You can walk in this, but you can't walk in that. The Bible said, and the gate swung open of its own accord. It swung open of its own accord. Praise God. If you and I will just get up, and let the light of God shine in us. Hear the message of the Lord. Live. That's his message. Jesus said, I came to be your life. I came to be your strength. I came to be your length of days. I'm your healing. I'm your health. I'm your strength. I'm your salvation. I'm your foundation. I'm your revelation. I'm your rock. I'm your authority. I'm everything to you. And you stand up and say, yes, Lord. Chains start falling off. Start walking with him. And when you get to the iron gate, what looks impossible, what's kept you out, it'll just swing open of its own accord. And he found himself in the street called Straight. And God will put you in the street called straight. Praise God. The church prayed without ceasing that he might be freed. And you know what? The church is to be commended for their zeal. But they didn't have much faith. How do you know that? Because when he went to the door, Rhoda come to the door, and she said, Ah! Slammed the door in his face and went back and told him and said, Peter's at the door and they said you're mad 
We've prayed all night that he be released, but he can't be standing at the door. You're mad. And then one of them said, well, maybe it's an angel. They went to the door. <laughs> Peter was standing right there. See, it was easier to get out of jail than it was to get into prayer meeting. Come on. It's easier to get out of jail to get in a prayer meeting. <laughs> Thank God for the church, but sometimes we just miss it. So Peter had confidence. What was his confidence? When thou art old. So you can have some confidence in what? We read it this morning. You have promise of the life that now is have some confidence in that promise put your confidence in that promise i have a promise i'll live praise god i have a promise i'll live put your confidence in it and you can rest and then rise in the strength of god and the gates and the doors that have held you out will open up and you can step into the place where you can walk in the straight and narrow way it's god's plan praise god confidence god wants you to have some confidence now let's close this morning go over to joshua 14 Let's finish up with, with this man. We're going to read these verses in exegete just a little bit, and then we'll draw to a close this morning. You ready? The children of Judah. Who are the children of Judah? Those who say, he shall be praised. Are you in the house this morning, Judah? He shall be praised. We're, we're born of praise. He shall be praised. They came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kizanite, said unto him, You know the thing the Lord said. I want to ask you a question. Do you know the thing the Lord said? You have promise of the life that now is. You have His Word. You have His Word. You have His Word. You have His Word. The Moses, the man of God, concerning me and you in Kadesh Barnea. That's when they went to spy out the land. Forty years old, just a young man full of promise and faith. When I was I, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy the land, and I brought him word again, look at it, it was mine in heart. Now, you've got to make these things yours in heart. This don't work because I preach it. It don't work because it's written in the Bible. He said it's mine in heart. So this man made that promised land his that day. Now, I want you to make healing yours today. I want you to make the covenant of God yours today. It's mine in heart. It's mine in heart. Because once it gets in your heart, it's going to come out of your mouth. It's mine in heart. Next verse. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. One of the most beautiful things about Caleb's life, notice he said, my brethren. He was not angry or offended with the men that kept him out. Let me just stop and say this. Walking in love will lengthen your days. Walking in bitterness, anger, jealousy, wrath, malice, those things will shorten your life. They'll raise your blood pressure. They'll put stress on your heart. They'll keep you up at night. They'll give you indigestion and ulcers. This man walked in forgiveness. You know what? Most of us get mad if somebody takes 45 minutes from us. These people took 45 years from this man. Can you imagine? 45 years. But he said, my brethren, I love that about him. He just would not call them a bunch of unbelieving hypocrites, a bunch of doubters. He said... They are my brethren. He wouldn't disown them even though they didn't believe. That's amazing. That's a phenomenal revelation. I wholly follow the Lord my God. Nevertheless, my brethren went up with me, made the heart of the people melt. I wholly follow the Lord my God. Let's go forward, please, to 10. Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, boy, this is the man of faith. The Lord has kept me alive. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Lord kept me alive. Do you know the Lord's kept me alive? You know, I do know that if the Lord hadn't helped me that day in the sickbed, I wouldn't be here. The Lord kept me alive. God kept me alive. I'm alive. God kept me alive. I'm here because He put a heartbeat in my chest. He put breath in my lungs. He woke me up in my right mind. He kept me alive. Praise God. 
As he said, these forty and five years since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I'm fourscore and five years old. Stop right there. Barzilla was only eighty and he was an old man. Caleb's eighty-five and he said, I'm as strong as I was when I was forty. Now stop, think about it. They're both under the law. They're both old covenant men. They both serve the same God. They both love the leadership they were under. Caleb served Moses and he served Joshua faithfully. What's the difference? The difference is what was in their heart. The difference in believers is what's in your heart. The difference, see, Barzilla was old at 80 and said, I want to die. Caleb said, I'm 85. Look, next verse, look at it. Look at it. Let's shout this morning. I'm as strong this day as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, my strength is now to war. Go in and come out. Praise God. Look at what was in his heart. I'm 85, but I'm strong. Look at Barzilla. I'm 80. I can't have here, and I can't have see. I don't discern like I used to. My food don't taste good. I'm just a burden, Caleb said. I'm 85. But God kept me alive. And that thing he promised, are you willing to give your promise up? Are you willing to give your promise up? There's people a lot younger than 85 gave their promise up. There are people sitting around 45 saying, oh, it just ain't going to happen. Will you stop it? Would you just stop all that stuff, all that unbelief and mess in your heart and in your mouth? Stop it. Caleb said, I'm 85. And I'm as strong this day as I was in the day Moses sent me. My strength was then, so is my strength now. Why? Why can he say that? Because he knew God was his strength. Your strength's not based on how old you are. Your strength on, is based on who God is. Let's quote it. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Next verse. Now therefore, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. Barzil, Barzilla saying, let me go die. Caleb said, give me my mountain, give me my mountain. What's your heart? What's your faith today? Give me my mountain as the Lord spake in that day. You heard in the day how the Anakims were there. They were the long neck giants. They, they had long necks. That's what that means. And the cities were great and fenced. If the Lord be with me, I'll be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. And Joshua blessed him. Can I tell you today, Jesus has blessed you. Your heavenly Joshua has blessed you. He ain't going to bless you. He has blessed you. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. You have the mind of Christ. Your Joshua has blessed you. The blessing of the Lord rests on you. The blessing of the Lord makes you rich. He adds no sorrow. You are the blessed of the Lord. You are not the cursed. You are the blessed of the Lord. And, and he gave Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance, which means the seat of association. That means this, is that Jesus is saying, you come up here and sit with me and we'll take the land together. You come on up here. He made us sit together with him in heavenly places. He took and made that place which was Kirjath Arba. He made it Hebron, the seat of God's inheritance. And we'll show you one more thing. Let's go to the end of this. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb. What's your inheritance? To sit with him in heavenly places. The son of Jephunneh, the Kezanite to this day, because he, what? Because he, not because God, he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. God's just looking for somebody to wholly believe this, really believe this, to believe that he has you alive, to believe that you're useful and valuable and purposeful, to believe that he wants to use you for his glory. And if you're 45, get ready. If you're 65, get ready. If you're 85, get ready. Not to die, but to live, to preach, to declare, to re... Hallelujah. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. Arba was a great man among the Anakims, which means he was the giant among the giants. He was the greatest. And the land had rest from war. When Caleb took Kirjath Arba, the land ceased to be in war. Now, Arba stood in his way. And Arba was just as big. And some Bible scholars believe he was bigger than, badder than Goliath. And you know, David was of Caleb's lineage. And you know, when David went out to face Goliath, he knew he had a giant killer. He had a testimony in his family. I come from a line of giant killers. I come from a line of giant killers. There's some giant killers in my family. Kirjath Arba was a great man among the Anakims and the land had rest for more. So here's what Caleb said. He said, you know what? 
those fenced cities and those giants stand in my way. So, you got some obstacles. You got some opposition. Praise God. Praise God. Well, you don't look too happy about your opposition. Praise God. Got some opposition. I've got some shortage. I've got some lack. I've got praise God for your opposition. Caleb said, Arba the giant is there. All the giants bow to Arba, but God said, it's my land. God said, Hebron is mine. And Caleb took the mountain. Caleb ran the Anakims out, and he killed Arba the giant. How did he do it? He did it by faith. And he did it when he was 85 years old. Praise God. Are you ready? We have a better covenant established on better promises. Stand with me in Jesus' name. I preach over you. I prophesy over you. You're giant killers. Your opposition cannot stand in your way. Giants can't keep you out of your promise. I preach over you. prophesy over you. I did it last night. You live and not die. You're strengthened many, many more good years. Many more good years in Jesus' name. Many more good years. God add length of days and long life to you and satisfy you with his salvation in Jesus' name. But I do hear the Lord saying, get ready to be used. 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 Hallelujah. The trumpet sounding this morning. Live. 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 I just keep hearing that so strong. Live. The Lord says live. The Lord says live. The Lord says live. Yeah, just go ahead and worship him in a minute. Just, just, just worship him just for a second. This is what I was looking for. This is the prophetic word of the Lord. Here, Ezekiel prophesying. And he says, When I passed by you, I saw you polluted in your own blood. I said unto you, When you were in your blood, live. Yea, I said unto you, When you were in your blood, live. Ezekiel 16, 6. Now, you're not in your blood anymore. You're in... Come on. Come on. You're in his blood. That is so strong today. When I saw you in your blood, I passed by you and I said, live. He's called you to life. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus. Abundant grace. Above what we can ask or think. The trumpet sounding. 80 years is not your limit. The trumpet sounding. 80 years passed away in my anger. But praise God, his anger's passed now. Jesus took the anger of God on the cross and put it away once, finally, and forever. God had reconciled the world to himself, and now we're living in the light of his countenance in his favor. And God's saying, live. God's saying, live. God's saying, live. In Jesus' name. So David said, I will live and not die and declare God's work to my generation. Thank you, Lord. 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 All right, elders, come stand with me, if you will, quickly. Come stand. Brother Thomas, you come on and lead us this morning. If you want prayer, if you need prayer, I encourage you to come forward. Let these 
good men and women of God lay hands on you and pray for you. And you rest assured that I prophesy over you daily, you will live. You'll live. You'll live. You'll live. You'll live. You'll live. You'll live. Now let me say this as well. Let me say this. That while they come up here, if you're in the congregation, you want to be involved, you want to pray, you come on up and pray too. We want to, anybody that wants to pray, we never want to make it sound like elders are the only ones can pray. If you want to pray, you come on pray. If you want to come up here and lay hands on somebody and pray, pray. We always encourage ministry here. I really feel like some of you need to come forward and have hands laid on you and commit yourself to purpose today. I really believe that. Commit yourself to purpose today. I'll live and not die. Declare God's work to my generation. If you need prayer, come on up. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for the Open Door family and our congregation. Lord, as some leave and some come to pray, thank you that your blessing rests on this family. Those that were here, not here, our internet family, we bless them today. And I bless you in Jesus' name. You watching by internet, I bless you. You'll live and not die. Declare God's work to your generation in Jesus' name. Let your glory rest on us, your strength, and we thank you. We believe you for life. In Jesus' name, we said together, amen. If you need prayer, come on. If you want to pray, come on. If you need to go, God bless you in Jesus' name.